working with communications to create an affordable housing committee page um, that has all of the resources that um, you guys, well, your meetings um, and information about what the, the work is that you all are doing and ultimately the recommendations that you um, move forward to council with um, would all kind of be posted there for public in, uh, public viewing anyway. Um, okay, hang on two seconds. I just need to minimize this so it's not. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. There we go. Okay. Okay. I believe I'm recording. Um, yeah, it says recording press. Okay. Awesome. I'm sorry, not good at doing all of this, but um, thank you all so much for coming, whether you're um, online or you're, you're here in person. Um, this is the second meeting um, and Rick Burby is here to kind of walk through some of the um, items that you all identified last time as being what potentially could be barriers um, in our current codes and regulations to the development of affordable housing. And then of course, maybe getting your input on things that you might want to see or recommend to uh, reduce or eliminate those codes. So, oh, hang on two seconds, sorry guys. Yes, English is correct. Mm-hmm, subtitles, wow, we are getting fancy. Okay, a uh, quick, uh, quick note on the agenda and we, because we felt we rushed you a little bit last time with regards to being able to share and talk and, and share ideas. Um, we wanted to um, make sure that we uh, gave you time to do that. So we put some times on our work or, uh, on our agenda items. Um, we put some times on here with regards to um, what we can talk through and things like that. Um, and uh, hopefully we can stick to these timings uh, as well. So, first of all, the review of the work plan and the discussion for meeting one, um, we wanted to kind of feedback and say what, what we heard, make sure we're not missing anything that you all talked about or that you all think is important. Um, the second is the presentation by Rick of our existing development code items. And then we're hoping to give you at least 45 minutes to talk through what you've heard today, um, talk through maybe ideas that you all have as, as far as, you know, how do we address some of these barriers. And then also wanted to get some feedback from you on the next two meetings. So we're about halfway through by the end of this meeting, we'll be halfway through the work um, and wanted to see how the structure's working. Are there things we need to make changes to, um, to better give you uh, the ability to give us feedback and to form the recommendations ultimately that will go to council. Um, so this is the work plan. You, we uh, have completed meeting one. Um, we will talk through what we heard about the top priority housing needs that you all have identified. And um, this is meeting two, where we're reviewing the existing city policies and the programs of the regulations. Um, and then we want to, again, revisit those priorities. How are these policies, programs, and regulations um, sort of bar creating barriers to development? If they are, if, if you, maybe they're not. Um, and that's what we need to hear from you. And then number three is what examples of other, are you seeing in other cities? Maybe other cities you worked in? What are examples of programs or policies that we could look at at our next meeting um, to think about, are there, are there additional things that you wanna put in your recommendations that you've seen work in other cities that you might wanna to take to council and recommend to council that we also consider for Golden? So, um, and then meeting three will be March 23rd. Um, meeting four, we'll finalize those recommendations, review them, talk through them, make sure everybody's in agreement on what we'll, what we'll move forward to council. And then right now this is stated, your recommendations are slated to go to the, the May 6th council study session. So uh, just a quick, what we have heard, we have, you guys had the chance to review the notes that, that uh, Lauren and Karen took uh, so uh, very well. Um, and we've kind of put some existing barriers, potential incentives, and then the third piece was, what types of housing do you all believe we need? So on the existing barriers, we heard you identify that parking requirements were a challenge, their growth ordinance was a challenge, there's a 25% commercial requirement. Those three things Rick will talk through with you deeper today um, on those items. We also heard there's the lack of middle income options for first-time home buyers. Um, there's not an established revenue source for the housing trust fund. And then we have limited amount of land for infill development. Um, on the potential incentives, uh, we heard interest in 
uh, density bonusing for affordable housing units, inclusionary zoning in exchange for maybe uh, the reduced commercial requirement, the 25% commercial requirement. Discussion around transit passes. If, for example, if there's a reduced parking requirement, in encouraging the owners or requiring the owners to provide some kind of transit passes as part of that. And then financial um, incentives for, um, okay, I'm gonna have to minimize myself here. Uh, oh, sorry, financial, um, financial incentives for, um, uh, I guess, restricted inventory there. Get rid of my own slide. We'll see it in a minute. Um, and then the types of housing that, that we saw you guys were saying we needed. Um, senior housing, home ownership for households at or below 120% of median. Um, rental uh, with options for equity building. And I think there's some more investigation around some legislation that's happening with that. Um, and then mixed income housing, student housing, and preservation. So those were the things we heard. Let me stop here now and say, are there things we're missing there? Um, were there things that were priorities to you all in that first meeting that would have come out of those, that first meeting that um, you believe we need to uh, add to these lists? Yeah, I'd like to add that we do need some more um, uh, basically subsidized housing. Uh, okay. Less than so lower, focus on the lower as well. Yeah, Are you I mean, thinking rental, yeah. Kathy. Uh, well, it'd be great if that could be home ownership, but at least rental. We need, we need, um, you know, housing for people who make less than fifty thousand dollars a year. Okay. And then um, that last one was, I think this was built off sort of the deed restricted. Uh, opportunities. And I th think the financial incentives for deed restricted inventory there, whether it could be ADU grants, whether it could be, um, you know, providing some kind of a, a, a grant to restrict the, uh, the even the, the property. Um, so and I think Scott dealt a lot more with this in the mountain communities with regards to, you know, deed restricting properties. It could be, I think you used it a lot for the workforce there. So, okay. Anything else besides sort of the um, um, the, the uh, deeper rentals or deeper rental and home ownership? It sounds like mm -hmm. it sounds like we should probably expand to rental and home ownership on that one. Um, where am I? This one. Man, you know, you, you get over 50 in technology. It's just, here we go. Um, so, yeah, so right now we have homeownerships for households that are below 120. And yes, that definitely could include the lower um, as well. Um, and Kathy, it sounds like you're looking to call it out a little bit more on the lower side as well. Yeah, I think if we don't call it out, it's not going to happen. Gotcha. Okay, then we will continue on. Okay. Question, Kathy, do you know where thousand dollar in income money earns that? About fifty percent. About fifty percent. Um. So AMI for a family of four here is a hundred percent, one hundred and seventeen thousand five hundred. So 50% might even be, if, a fa if you're talking about a family before, probably slightly below the 50% mark. No, so, I mean, this list as a whole, uh, to me, covers the gamut. Um, but I think in this conversation, it's worth considering policy changes that continue to foster and nurture an environment that creates housing supply. Because we're seeing the need for housing supply across the board. And so, um, you know, the incentive side of the equation makes a lot of sense where you're not further um, burdening market rate housing um, to balance the economic equation to subsidize affordable housing, but affordable housing can be subsidized in and of itself through a variety of sources. Um, and then, you know, continue to have an environment that's conducive to building housing of all types because because it seems that was what was needed was the full spectrum. Um, and, and I just wanted to make sure that we're considering that going forward. And that's where some of these incentives that we 
that were highlighted make a lot of sense. So hopefully you can hear me or, you know, over there and. Um, Kathy was nodding her head. Yes. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Come in and talk about those things. Unavailability of land. So would we ever consider pleasant view available for any of initiatives that we would want to offer? Because it's right there, it's got golden address and it's more susceptible to housing than growth. So it's just a question I put before the committee. There's also a mobile home park there that Ulysses is where Ulysses is. One side of it is in the city and the other side is not. So I think we should consider the proximity in terms of the commute and the sustainability that doesn't direct would represent for building with regard to. Okay. I can do you, you guys hear that okay? That was Paul. We could hear some words. Can you just summarize it in just a, a sentence or two? Yeah, and what was the yes. is, was it a parcel of land? Uh, this pleasant view. Heard that. Pleasant view. Okay, pleasant thank you. Pleasant view. So it was uh, it was Paul's idea, his thought was possibly considering pleasant view um to uh as as a opportunity for some of the affordable housing or some of the housing in general. So, um, okay, I'm, I want to make sure we're resolving that. Is it help if we're in the microphones better? Is that is that make things better? Okay. Yeah. I think people okay. just need to speak up a little bit. Okay, we will do that. In fact, Rick, it's going to be super super I'll loud. Be loud. Okay. And, and we're also working on uh, we're working on alternatives here um, as well. We just we we potentially may go to the clerk's computer, but I don't want to lose a lot of time here as well. So, okay. So we're going to turn it over to Rick. Um, to talk through the slides uh, for today with regards to affordable housing barriers and opportunities. Yeah, you want to twist it around. Okay. okay. Ooh. <laughs> All right. All right, well, welcome. We just welcomed uh, Jason joining us here and um, we'll get started. I know time is kind of critical, so we'll get going. Uh, as Janet mentioned earlier, we uh, in the 1st meeting, there were some barriers identified by the group. Um, these these 4 barriers were uh, what we thought we would focus on today as a, uh, as, as some, some things we can, we can look at to see if there's a difference that can be made. Uh, um, you know, moving some of those standards. So, first is parking. Then the second one is the mixed use zoning requirement, which is, uh, you know, requires a 25% commercial component uh, in those districts. And then sustainability and energy regulations. We talked about net zero coming our way uh, through council. And then the 1% uh, growth ordinance, uh, which is a frequent topic when, when we're talking about things like multifamily and affordable housing. So, uh, next one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a good. So Scott just mentioned we, uh, because of the uh, limitations of our microphones today, uh, we'll hold questions until the end. I'll go through this and then you can, uh. Have an opportunity to ask the questions about these, these, uh, you know. Turn later, uh, so. Uh, so for for parking, our parking standards, uh, we have a multi, I'm, I'm looking at multifamily in particular, because that's usually what affordable housing uh, fits into and multifamily uh, residences have parking requirements that are that are based on the number of bedrooms. And so you can see there uh, 1 bedroom, uh, 1 and 2 bedrooms are 1 and a half parking spaces and then it's 
two parking spaces for three bedrooms and above. And there currently is no uh, reduction available for affordable housing or any other situation. So it's it's uh, kind of a one size fits all for uh, for the parking regulations. And cost, of course, of parking is is pretty high. It, it can it can be very high depending on the type of parking you're you're constructing. Uh, with with sub you know subsurface parking being the most expensive, but there was a there was a uh, study done that was in in the um, set of documents you all had to review. It was done locally here on the Front Range in 2020, and um, you know there, there's there's more nuance to this, but the sort of general headline is that roughly half of the income restricted parking spaces are not being used, and and there was some the nuances were related to AMI, right? So there's you know the the higher you go on the AMI probably need more parking and then you know 30% AMI is is probably very little parking is is actually needed especially if located near transit and in other multimodal uh, facilities so we did a we did a small study with the help of Lori Rosendahl and her staff on the flats on Ford project and uh, that's a 60% AMI project and uh, they have 44 units there and the mix of bedrooms that that they have on site required 58 parking spaces. So that was what they built. And we did parking study. They did parking study for three different days um, uh, during the week, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, and the most spaces that were ever used were 35 spaces in those three days. And that was 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. So before everybody went to church or something. Uh, and so, uh, so, so that is, you know, 35 spaces out of 58. That's, that's not a lot of parking utilization, uh, a little more than half. Uh, so is there an opportunity? That's the, the question that we're kind of asking the group. Is there an opportunity to look at re reducing parking requirements? And maybe what should that look like? Um, from at least for affordable projects and whether it's on a sliding scale or just a, you know, a, a standard requirement for affordable up to 120%, which is what we've been talking about. Uh, that's that's uh, that's a question. Um, and then this brings us to the mixed use component that I mentioned uh, a bit ago. So we, our mixed use zone districts are found all over town. But um, if you think of the downtown area, that's that's a mixed use zone district. Uh, the areas along South Golden Road, along West Colfax Avenue, those are areas that are primarily zoned uh, one of these mixed use uh, categories. And so th there's a lot of opportunity for redevelopment in a lot of these areas. And uh, one of the requirements for mixed use is that at least 25% of the gross square footage is is commercial or non-residential, I should say. So, um, you know, affordable housing projects rarely want non-residential. They, they generally want 100% residential uh, uh, and not, not commercial components. And so our current regulations allow exceptions to that, but, um, you know, it is, it's, it's another hurdle, right? You have to go and get a special use permit or you have to rezone the property to allow 100% uh, residential, and this this adds uncertainty, it adds time, uh, and uh, and and complexity. And so, um, you know, these these types of things are are more expensive. And um, in, in in addition to having the you know mixed use component within a building uh, being more expensive, it's also more complex with the building code. Right? You have commercial code requirements, and you have residential code requirements that have to occur in the same building. And, and that that adds more expense and, and time and complexity as well. So. OK. Oh, OK, well, we're, we're trying to correct the problem. So uh, hang on, hang on. Uh, maybe we'll have a better questioning period if that comes to fruition. Uh, so, so again, yeah, we have these current regu uh, regulations and, uh, they do create some hurdles here and some uncertainty and expense. And so is there an opportunity to address this in code? Is there an opportunity for, uh, you know, waiving these 25% non-residential, uh, requirements if a certain percentage is affordable housing, for example, um, what, 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 what can we do on that front? And also. Uh, relatedly, are there are there bonuses that can be given to affordable housing projects, such as increased height, such as increased square footage allowances, or uh, you know not having to comply with the stepped back upper story requirement that's that's in our code? Um, so that you can. Ooh, 
Sounds like progress. Uh, let's see how do I get it back to, to Jenny. Let me I'll mute my. Is that better? Here? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. just now we can't hear Rick. Well, well, now we have the echo and that's even worse. Hang on all, we're going to try something else. I can hear when you're talking through the mic though too. If I do this, if is I that better? This? No, it's not. That gets that loses that that goes bankrupt. I just think we need to you know be sure that that's not something that uh, is going to be a gotcha. Can you explain it? Say that again. I didn't follow. If you have a restaurant on the first floor as part of the twenty five percent national statistics show that each new restaurant on average fails, and even the second one fails, and so if you lost that commercial, it, it was there when you started, but then it went away. Does that impact the housing above it? 
Well, it's not tied to the business, though. Yeah, it, should, yeah. it shouldn't impact the housing directly. It might it might impact the the, the building owner and their profitability. But I, I, well, I wouldn't want it to say if it's not if it's no longer commercial because that commercial failed. It's now right. The commercial is not occupied. Oh, right. Well, yeah, it's it's still a non-residential use, even if it's not in play at the moment. Just, I just want to be sure we say that. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Because yeah. you could have a situation where you, you don't have difficult space. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I think that's what you're getting That's to. what I'm getting at. Yeah. And it doesn't make any money. <laughs> yeah. Also, if you have density bonuses and you don't eliminate or change the 't hear I don't know if everybody else can but I'm hearing nothing at all and it sounds like the meeting is continuing and we can't hear so just me <laughs> now I can hear you is it echoing a little bit but I'd rather have an echo than not hear you at all so. And did we purposely take down the uh, slides or is that just on our end? Okay. Uh, I've tried muting it and unmuting it and it's the same. Yeah, I have to sit very far away. To WebEx here. I think it's working okay right now. At least I'm not hearing okay. it. Okay. It's not. It's not needed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now we can see it. Okay. We're, we're going to go back to where we were. Sorry about this technology. Okay. 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 Can you hear me? We turn the speakers. Yes, we can hear you, Rick. Okay. Uh, uh, apologies for the echo in this room, everybody. Uh, but I'll continue. I'll just I'll just march on. The uh, the opportunities here then are for the uh, waiver of the twenty five percent commercial, in some fashion, and then the height bonus or or other density type bonuses that. That uh, we could all consider as relief. It's not an answer. Yeah, I can. Oh, that's better. If it's better for me anyway. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, it's good. Good here. Okay. All right. So laptop only. Um, so uh, on to sustainability, our current sustainability energy uh, policy related to new construction is based on our site development code in chapter 1840 of our code. We, we have sustainability standards and we have a sustainability menu of, of options that that people can choose from to meet their, uh, their their point requirement. Currently, that's 20 points plus the standards that are in there. 
And this menu has been around for, for quite a while now, it's, but it's evolved over the past uh, dozen years or so. Uh, it's become increasingly focused on uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, and, and nowadays, uh, as of a couple of years ago, it's 10% of energy on site has to be renewable, um, uh, produced in a renewable fashion. Uh, solar is always what is chosen in the past. And, uh, and, and, you know, and the energy efficiency requirements are upped as well. And generally, to meet the 20 points, you have to do uh, a, a lot of energy efficiency and, and additional renewable energy than the 10%. That's, that's part of the standard. So that's where things have been going. It's generally tightened every couple of years or so. It's a, it's a combination of planning commission and our sustainability board that work together on, uh, on, on, on getting this uh, updated in, uh, in a regular fashion. And so we all talked about this last time, but you know the city's moving towards a net zero energy standard, and this is a performance energy standard. As I said, the code's been moving towards energy uh, with the sustainability for a while, and this will, you know, cement that. This is this is really going uh, towards a performance model where electrification would be required for new structures, 100% of uh, of uh, solar requirement on site. Um, to offset energy use, and uh, and so uh, it's it's definitely uh, moving this in a in a much stronger direction towards uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, council heard a uh, request from C from sustainability board a couple weeks ago, and advised uh, staff to come forward with a uh, an ordinance for them to consider. So that's that's what is being created now. But as far as what that ordinance uh, in, includes, uh, part of uh, part of that ordinance will have exemptions and waivers and such included in it, and that's still being thought through. But uh, but perhaps that is an that is an opportunity for an affordable housing, um, you know, for affordable housing to be addressed in in those in those exemptions and, and waivers and so forth. Um, you know, this will again focus just on new structures for now, but in the future, it likely include existing structures uh, to include remodels and additions and such. Um, and so, uh, you know, are there opportunities to uh, provide relief for affordable housing or, or is that needed? And I know we talked about the upfront costs of, of doing uh, some of some of these net zero requirements, such as the 100 percent solar or the uh, the the. Heating requirements, you know, the, the, the technology that is used, such as heat pumps to, to create um, the electrification and the, uh, the, the net zero opportunity. So, if that comes in the form of a, a special fund to help fund these, these types of um, increased requirements, or is it exemptions, waivers, or is it a combination of all of those items? That's something to consider. Uh, the 1% growth ordinance, uh, that's it's been in place for since 1996, and um, anytime you have a new residential unit added to Golden, it first needs an allocation, and uh, so there's a process for that. 1% uh, of our uh, housing stock uh, currently is um, is 88 units uh, for for 2023. That's and so that that's how many allocations can be assigned in a given year. Um, larger housing uh, developments they usually apply for a banking plan. That's how you can save allocations over time so that you have enough to start your project. In order to get a building permit, you have to have enough allocations to start your building. Um, so that can, for larger projects, that can take some time. Um, we had a, the, the project, just as an example, the project up north, the senior housing, uh, at least it started as senior housing, uh, was 120 units, and it took them a couple years uh, to to save up the allocations to to start construction. And so those allocations are are available on a first come first serve basis. So there's competition. If you have multiple projects, especially multiple large projects coming in at the same time, they each get an equal share if they're already in that in that year. So uh, you know some some years uh, you can get a project done, a larger project done much more quickly. If the competition is low, but that's that's unpredictable, creates more uncertainty, and um, and I think that uh, in our experience, the the financing side of of construction has has had some heartburn about this. Um, but that's both the, the banking sector as well as Chaffa for uh, for giving tax credits for these types of projects, and so um, that's that's been an issue in the past, and it it has presented a barrier. 
and uh, we, we talked a little bit about flat, the Flats on Ford project and, and Lori's project, uh, and, and we can kind of get into that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, one, one thing to consider is that we have a 1% growth ordinance, but from 2000 to 2022, we actually have 8.8% growth. So we're not using the whole 1%. Um, I think the main factor from, from staff's perspective, from my perspective, is that uh, there's, there's very little available land, that, that, our, that our land costs and our land availability uh, are the main contributing factor to that. Uh, it is hard to assemble parcels to to negotiate with landowners, especially where you already have a, a structure on site, because all of our all of our development is really redevelopment, and finding a, a price point that works for exist for an existing site is, is difficult. Um, another factor, I think, um, from my perspective, is, and I don't know how big a factor it is, is that that, that some multifamily developers, not just affordable multifamily developers. Are scared off by the 1% growth ordinance and the uncertainty that it creates and, uh, and so kind of kind of further that. That argument, um, so there have been amendments made to the 1% growth ordinance over time. Uh, early on, there were senior exemptions for the 1% growth ordinance. Uh, th those actually sunsetted in 2013. We, we didn't have great. Luck with senior exemptions because most of these projects traded them in for regular allocations after they were built, including the project I just mentioned, the 120 unit uh, senior project on New Star Way, just above Golden Gate Canyon Road. So that that the, the biggest building up there um, had 120 units. They had they had a number. I can't remember the exact number, but a, but a, but a good percentage of that was uh, they got in just before the senior exemption sunsetted. And so they were able to take advantage of that, but they over over the following two, three years, they traded them all in for regular allocations. They didn't want to be bound by the senior requirement, even though they are primarily a senior housing uh, facility. Same is true of the uh, Clear Creek Commons. That's on 11th Street, um, just east of Washington Avenue, those apartments along the creek. So, um, they, you know, we, we haven't had um, Many takers and the takers we've had have, have reverted. Uh, so it's just something to, to consider um, in the history of things. But um, in 2013, while that sunsetted, the opportunity was created for uh, what, what we commonly refer to as early start. It's actually called reapportionment in the code, but it allows in 2013, it allowed transit oriented developments to take part in early start, meaning you can get your some percentage of your allocations early so that you can start your project earlier, reduce that uncertainty to some degree. Um, and in 2018, the affordable housing units uh, uh, were added to that list, uh, the short list of two things that could get early start. And that was that was created in conjunction with Lori's Flats on Ford project. We worked together to to get that into code and that that allows uh, those who take it, those who can take advantage of it up to 120% AMI for that early start. Um, one of the tricks of the early start, though, is that you can only get up to one third of the allocations in a given year uh, to 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 use for early start. So in 2023, that would be 29 units, which is helpful. But if you have a 120 unit project, it's still you know, only covering a percentage of that, and you still have to have a banking plan and save up allocations for those uh, those remaining units. Um, Given depending on how competitive that year is, it could take it could take some time still, and that of course is uncertainty. Um, so uh, so you know, in looking at opportunities to address this potential barrier, there are uh you know things we can look at and uh and that's kind of a conversation for the group are there exemptions for affordable housing units for example that can be um that can be offered and uh and is that up to 120 percent ami if that's the case and um you know what degree of exemption would uh, would be appropriate um oh and this is right over my talking uh, points here let me see. I think I can, yeah, I can pull it. I'll just I'll just cover up the Taj here. Um, 
So just some other thoughts. I think this was, there was a question about uh, PUD zoning and, and how that could impact affordable housing. And just, just, just broadly, PUD zoning is, a, is, a, is, a, is customized zoning. It's essentially saying we want to do something that's, that's outside of your code. We want to order off the menu. We want to do something that is specific to our project uh, that will, um, and generally what that is is a, a negotiation between the city and the applicant, and, and it's, a, it's a way to get something that both sides would like to see, um, hopefully. And so, you know, you can, you can craft a PUD zoning to include affordable housing elements. And that's what Course Tech did. If you followed that process, um, that was a rather lengthy and, 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 and anomal, an anomalous project, but it is still uh, representative of what you can do with, with the PUD. Um, I, I, I think that PUDs offer uh, opportunities, but they also increase the process, the time, the uncertainty, all of those things, because it is a rezoning. It's you have to go through neighborhood meetings and planning commission and city council, and all of it has to be negotiated along the way. And you don't really know where you'll end up. So uh, when you enter that process, there is a, a quite of a, quite a lot of uncertainty um, associated with it. So, you know, from a staff perspective, uh, we would rather have it baked into code what we want, have those options available and without having to go through these customized processes uh, for, for a variety of reasons related to time uncertainty process. Um, and I think you, you can get better outcomes when there's more predictability. Uh, so that's something to consider. It is an option in some cases, but ideally um, our code could, could support the needs that we have and the desired outcomes that we have. Uh, another factor, because because you know, affordable living includes both housing, but it also the large component of that is your transportation costs. So, um, you know that relates to the parking requirement and and, and the you know the degree of to which that uh, they use in a, a private automobile for their transportation needs. You know all of these projects we we always talk about how the, the the perfect place for affordable housing is close to transit and other multimodal options. So bike facilities, sidewalks, and just general walkability around the project. So, you know, the, the Flats on Ford project is a great, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, example of how that can, can be uh, put into a, a great location where it's highly walkable. There's a market nearby. This is 24th and Ford, by the way. Uh, so it's very walkable. There's also bike facilities. There's, uh, you know, uh, opportunity to get on the 16 bus, which is our our main transit line in town, and it can get you all the way to Denver. Um, so uh, that's a perfect location for things like that. But um, but but uh, you know, supporting transit service, we're working on on uh, transit service uh, service now with Jason and his team at Mines. We're trying to get a few lines up and running this year, and uh, and and the, that is envisioned as a free shuttle program. Uh, so supporting more of those things in the future is is a uh, an opportunity to increase affordable living for all folks in town, but especially affordable, uh, especially those kind of more um, income restricted uh, properties. And then this is sort of a thing that I, I like to mention, but I have been mentioning this for years. The Jeffco campus seems very underutilized from my perspective. It's right next to a light rail station. Uh, there's human services on the campus to support. Um, Folks who do have lower incomes, and uh, there's lots of green space there. More green space than we have almost anywhere else in town. Uh, the PUD doesn't currently allow mixed use residential, but that could be something we could pursue in cooperation with with Jefferson County. It is it is within the city uh, boundary to uh, to maybe have some allowances for for affordable housing and, and some of the retail support that could go along with that. Um, so that is, I think that is all from, from me here. It's not advancing the slide currently. Let's see. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So next steps, next do, you, do you want to take over from yes. this section? Okay. I think the microphones are working. I'm going to see if I, um, so click this. Oh. Audio. Okay, because it does have audio when we have hearings. That's my sense of my technical problem. Okay, we're going to see if we can talk and you guys can still hear us. Um, so either either that or 
Okay, awesome. So they can hear me. The question is, will they be able to hear you all? And that's the important part because I'm not important here. Um, I'm going to hide this window. I might should not have done that. Um, so we've we've hidden the window. Hang on, probably bring that back because um, I want to make sure we can still see them. Sorry. There we are. Okay. Um, want to make sure we can still see you guys, but. The, the next steps is really discussion and we've budgeted tr almost trying 45 minutes to an hour to let you guys talk. Um, you know, we've, we've presented policies, programs and regulations to you. You, you obviously, as many of you have developed, uh, you understand how these barriers are, like Stefka bringing up how they're all interrelated, whether it's density or commercial or parking. Um, if, if there are recommendations you might like to, uh, to bring to the table at this point to address the barriers. Um, and then before we leave, this will be the last piece, examples of things from other cities you've seen that you've worked in that make affordable housing work well. Not that we have to discuss those today, but what we want to do is capture those ideas and bring them back to you in the next meeting to have a thorough discussion. Because meeting three is totally dedicated to what other cities are doing that we might be able to replicate here and how those can help form the recommendations. And then finally, you know, are these structures of this meeting working? Maybe this is not the great meeting to ask that because the technology is not working for sure. Um, um, I will make the commitment to get that fixed next time. Um, so I guess the other thing with regards to the 1% ordinance, some folks ask what other cities were doing. Um, let me just share what we heard from Lakewood. Um, so Lakewood also has a growth ordinance and we reached out to their planners to see what they did with regards to affordable housing with related to their growth ordinance, just as an example to share with you. Um, so, uh, Shannon, who's the planner over there that we have contact with, said that they, um, that last July in 2022, they created the affordable housing exemption. So, it's not been in place for quite a year at this point. Uh, to date, nobody has taken a, a advantage of the exemptions for affordable housing yet. Um, it's a voluntary program. It, and essentially, if a development provides 100% affordable housing at 80% of AMI for rental or 100% of AMI for home ownership projects, they're completely exempt from the, afford from the growth ordinance. So they don't have to get allocations or anything like that. If a development project provides, and this is to get at the mixed, in mixed use piece, um, development provides 20% affordable housing at 80% of AMI for rental and 120% for home ownership, they can secure, they can do the build ahead thing. So they can secure advanced allocations in that, in those situation. Early start, yes, they call it build ahead here. Um, and, and then they can later, they can secure those allocations later administratively, like we talked about as well. Um, the, they say the few unknowns for them is, is the 20% too high for developers to take advantage for the affordable units? In other words, is that too high a barrier for those mixed, those market rate developers to wanna take advantage of that? Um, and they have consultants looking at that. Um, and then they're looking at enforcement models and home ownership models. I mean, the idea that you can, you can take advantage of the senior exemption and then buy your way back out of it, um, it kind of defeats the purpose. Um, and so what, one of the things they're looking at, maybe you all might want to consider as well is, are there things, you know, commitments you want to make, put in place to make sure those things don't go away. So. So I'm just going to open it up and you guys had ideas and thoughts and share, and we'll be here to capture um, what we can. Um, so keep talking. Okay. Um, I'm going to see if we can, um, we can talk loud enough. Uh, so I guess. What I'll say is if everybody can sort of project their voice, we'll try to keep this kind of in the middle of the room um, and hopefully people can hear us because we're also recording this. So I also want to make sure we, we capture what, you, what your discussion is. So if you guys are um, cannot hear us, we have your faces up. Please wave at us or somehow, you know, get our attention to let us know that you cannot hear us. Thank you. 
Um, yes, I wanted to uh, ask Rick before we jump off with this. When you hear this, what is your rea- like? When you hear what Lakewood has done, um, what kind of barriers would that set for you and the planning department? But then also too, is there, is it because it's so new that no one's taken advantage, or is there? Yeah, just want to hear your thoughts of what Lakewood has done there. Well, yeah, so so Lakewood modeled their 1% growth ordinance very much uh, off of Golden's 1% growth ordinance. And it's it's new. It's only a couple years old, two, three years old. Uh, they So they, they haven't had a lot of experience with it, and it, it makes sense that they don't have direct experience yet, uh, you know, for, for that uh, communication from the planner. Um, I, I, um, I think it takes time for people to get a project together and, and, and see if they, you know, can, can achieve compliance with those types of exemptions. I, I don't know about, I mean, that's probably a better question for developers as to, you know, is this really reducing the barrier there, uh, you know, by, by, by what they're doing by giving exemptions, um, you know, or is there a better way to do that that, that you think would be more effective? That we could employ here in, in Golden. I know this. It's not. It's you know we don't have any evidence to support whether this works or not. But so I think we're still kind of you know operating without any guidance here. I think it's still you know up for debate what could work to actually move move this forward. Janet, could you? We're probably going to see Rick's slides as part of a you know after the meeting as notes for the meeting. But on the one that he had that addressed this. Could we add what Lakewood is doing in with that slide or the mm-hmm. next slide so that we'll have it all in one place? Is that a possibility? Absolutely. Okay. Question about the so Lakewood I, ordinance. Sorry. Do we want to have, as we think about the shuttle, which is a great idea, uh, is proximity to the shuttle going to be a factor in giving an exemption? Uh, for parking, if it's, and I don't know what, but just to say we have a shuttle and the, the new proposed units are half a mile away, that, that doesn't make sense. But the proximity would be addressing sustainability about as an offset that they are close to the shuttle. Another one, uh, the person meeting to, to my right said at the last, I know. <laughs> said at the last meeting that he, that he had arranged with RTD to get passes called echo passes for the faculty. And we've discussed that a little bit in the city now about whether we want to do something, but it could be that we could get echo passes for those in affordable units as an offset to parking. In other words, it just say, hey, parking, we're going to slash it. But the public would say, well, wait a second, we're not just cutting it. We're, we're trying to offset it with other sustainable measures, such as RTD passes. So I'm just making that as a suggestion that we're not ignoring the parking requirement. We're trying to, to uh, manage it better in keeping with sustainability goals. Another way to do that is through open space through overlay areas where there's a strategy around where you can and should use parking um, so that you can say, like, we know that this has proximity to the shuttle or whatever it is. And in those areas, we're going to try to have less parking, not just that we're going to make exceptions, but like there's a concentrated effort to, you know, reduce dependence on cars in these particular areas. And so it can be a very strategic thing from a climate perspective as well as from a housing perspective. And that, you know, having um, development in those areas has sort of a by right, um, you know, where you can just say, we're not gonna have parking or we already are gonna have this different set of parking requirements. I wanna follow up to, I love your comments and I mean this, but I accept one. Except you don't. No, I do. <laughs> but I think um, we have to be all in on it in terms of uh, transit sustainability. Um, because if we're not, and it changes or goes away, 
because it's not utilized properly. We can buy all the eco passes we want. No one will use them and we can reduce parking on projects. And then we're going to be creating another problem for ourselves. So, uh, I like the ideas, but that means we are committed to make it work. And that requires investment. Well, I heard last time when you spoke about it, you said 35% jump within the first month of the mm -hmm. first few weeks. So can you hear us there as I... So I agree with you, we need to, it's not just a good idea. We have to put some meat on the bones to be sure that we're all in and that it's part of a something sustainable that will work. And I don't mean sustainable in the touchy touchy. I mean, sustainable in terms of lasting. And, and I, I agree with you. I think that's, we can't just talk about it and put a thing in place if we don't have the wherewithal behind it to make it work. Because some of the feedback, uh, just to wrap up that point, some of the feedback we're hearing from our faculty and staff who obtain their eco pass is, this is fantastic. Now I just wish I could use it. Because there's not the lines, there's not the infrastructure in place that you can get anywhere. Yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking about yeah. the shuttle mm -hmm. and the Route 16 route for getting to the, the metro line up at the Taj Mahal. That we need to be sure that the total package is something that works. That's right. Okay. I've said enough. Who wants to talk? Oh, here, it's all yours. I've got. So kind of um, TOD and use overlays are are often addressed in a comprehensive plan, planning and zoning, a visioning plan, and can serve serve the whole community based on what that vision is. And and you know reduced parking tends to go along with that as just a general philosophy. So kind of setting that aside and leaning into the nuance of affordable. Um, it's, it's worth mentioning a few things. Um, you know, Lakewood has recently adopted the growth ordinance. They also have 70,000 something residents. So annually they're looking at 700 permits versus 88. So if I'm looking at a hundred unit, 200 unit project, um, you know, community multifamily community, that still looks very viable from that pool. So I think one thing that makes Golden unique and different is the growth ordinance um, and, you know, to your potential speculation, not putting words in your mouth, Rick, I'll say, you know, from my perspective, that's a nuance of golden that makes it more challenging and is a barrier. Um, some developers see that barrier as, you know, a moat that protects their asset and, you know, maybe play the game on the early start and trade in senior for um, typical permits, but, you know, that's, that's a huge nuance of golden and um, not here to, um, I don't think that's going away, but the challenge with the early start process is you're, you're just taking from yourself down the line. So if I get my 29 early start permits, whatever's remaining of the 88, I should know that math pretty quickly, 59, whatever it is. Um, can I then get another third of that 59 that's left potentially like, cause there's, it seems like there's a game being played of. So, so I get my early start, but then I have to wait for my next third. And so the challenge it creates overall is timing and certainty. And that's whether it's affordable for Chaffa, like Lori experienced and highlighted last week, whether it's just general market rate, um, you know, every year in Colorado, construction costs have increased. 2022, it increased 30%. It was an exorbitant year. Typically, it's 10%. So if I'm waiting three years, four years to get my allocation of permits, 30, 40% of hard cost increase makes my deal very, very challenging to make the math work on. And what in turn happens to make that deal still work and hit any sort of return um, to keep debt and equity committed to the project as my rents go up, right? Like that's the only lever. My hard costs increase. I have to increase my rent to solve the same equation. So the, the delay of banking is creating the uncertainty. And then the banking process, you know, the, the largest forfeiture I saw was like overlook, I think, in what you provided, Janet, which I'm guessing was at the end of five years of banking. And then they, 
had to give it up or how does that work and wait they can hear okay but you got to keep passing that computer <laughs> that's the challenge of kind of the early start game and banking versus Right. Yeah. So before Rick talks, I, I'm proposing that we, you know, waive the early start. And we just say, if you if you've got it and you want to build it, you can do it, but you don't have to wait. So I mean, I'm just saying we ought to just go all in on that piece. Now, and I've got another comment about the one percent. I just wanted to comment on your comment. Yeah, well, you can get some extensions to a banking plan. That's possible, and that's what Overlook did. But eventually, they run out, and they they had to give them up. And so that's that's they had Overlook for those. Of, I don't know if everybody knows what Overlook is, but yeah, exactly. It's that was a single family development that um, was platted years ago, two thousand six. It's never been built. It's single family homes on a hillside above I seventy. And uh, and it, it just it uh, so it had been sitting there for quite a while, and we just we needed to have those go away. They were so we lost those fifty five allocations, and whoever wants to develop that site in the future has to start all over again, and save up allocations. Uh, the thing with one of the, one of the you can't get them back; they're gone. Uh, one of the things that in in this maybe you've already come to this conclusion, but. When you're doing single family, it's a lot easier to get allocations and build as you go. When you're doing multifamily, especially if it's all in one building, you know, you wait. And that's that's a disadvantage. We're, we're, we're disadvantaging multifamily on that front. Uh, some people will break it into, into different buildings to get started earlier because you have, you, you know, you can't build your building until you have all your allocations. So if you split it up into three buildings, you can start with one building, move on to the next one, and it gives you a little bit of, of, of room there to to move faster, uh, but it is a, it is, you know, it, it's still a barrier that, that single family doesn't face as much. So Rick, what do you see as the impact? Uh, yeah, I'll be quick. Love to... What do you see as the impact of the, if you were to just have a blanket waiver for any project that was 100% affordable, mm -hmm. like Lakewood? Well, if you, if you, it kind of, kind of to Paul's point, if you, or others, or your point, uh, Tyler, I mean, if you don't have to pay it back, if you're not borrowing from yourself, um, it doesn't take away from the market rate units. I think that would be that would be beneficial. I think if if affordable housing projects could get started right away, and they didn't weren't limited to one third, uh, you know, of, of available allocations in a given year, and we didn't have to pay it back into the system, it it could, you know, we could get more units. I have I have one question. Slide that over. <laughs> Um, I, I'm just curious, it, you showed the chart, you showed the graph where what we had for allocations versus what we've actually used. So there's a gap there. There's some number. I don't know what that number is, but it was, it looked like several hundred um, allocations that have never been used. And so I guess one question I would ask, is that another thing that this group might want to consider as a recommendation is even if, if there were a, a blanket exemption to workforce housing um, or if there wasn't would one proposal be take the missing the the number of allocations that have never been used and say those allocations are available for workforce housing projects if it's 300 of them that we throw that pool out and say that's the exemption or that's the change to the growth ordinance up front uh, to allow for some other about uh, amount of workforce or affordable development to be done. Okay, so that's just another thing I wanted yeah. to throw out on the table as a possibility. And I guess Kathy, and your, and your Kathy, do you have a comment? Kathy, can you hear us? Yeah, um, I uh, I thought you we guys were you. Around the... you can't. I'm talking. Can you hear me? While she's talking, let me add that that Lakewood <laughs> is 160,000. I think. Hang on, hang on. Kathy's confused. I I'm talking. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can now. Okay. Um. Well, I no. I'll, I I thought you were going around the uh, table, so I'll just wait. Hopefully, we can go yeah. around the. You're up. Oh, I'm up. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, 
so I had a question about the Lakewood. Um, the, the old version had a had it so that all the affordable housing was built in blighted areas. That's how they were getting around it. Is that gone though? I can check on that. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's limited to a particular area. Okay. Well, the 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 building so far has been um, restricted in my in my understanding to blighted areas. So it would be good to understand that and maybe not make that the case for us. Um, another thing, you know, I, I, I understand, um, that supply is very important. Um, and I support that, but I don't want to lose track of the preservation part and the smart infill part, uh, as part of our discussions too. So I, I would like to just raise that up that I think that that needs to be there. And, um, look, looking at the 1%, um, I think. Definitely, there needs to be just um, uh, exclude subsidized uh, income restricted uh, affordable housing from this just because it's so hard to get the financing. Um, now, looking at the unused, uh, the un unused uh, allocations has been tossed around in the past and I think there's a, a, a good reason to, to consider that for sort of more workforce housing, which is really sort of the 80 to 120 percent. Um, that's not how our housing needs assessment used it, but that's how it's used in the in the outside world. So for rentals, that's market rate housing and maybe a smidge above. Uh, so perhaps we don't do a full exclusion for that. Um, but I think the subsidized housing really does need um, to just make it as easy as possible for for folks to get the um, the funding, and I had a question for Rick about PUD zoning. Um, my understanding is that that this really, um, in the long term, restricts the city from having influence on these areas. And you know, when the when the uh, uh, rezoning did their diagnostic report, they were talking about half of the city being PUD zoning. And I assume that's pretty much the single family zoning. And if you add the RE zoning to that, that's 65% of the city that's kind of not influenceable by our zoning uh, requirements. So I was happy to hear that you prefer to, you know, kind of fix our code. Uh, and instead of doing these specialty zonings, because I think 20 years down the road, you know, when we're going to be wanting to affect change and redevelopment, that the, the PUD zoned areas are going to make that very difficult. And really, the the area of influence that the city has right now, that's not PUD zoned, is just sort of the central part of the city, and maybe a smidge along South Golden Road and and West Colfax. So I would like to see us do kind of more long-term planning of the areas that we really do have an influence over and try to affect that through our zoning code. So those are my no, I, comments. Yeah, thank, thank you, Kathy. That's definitely in alignment with, with staff and the way we've been approaching this uh, as far as all the rezoning efforts. Uh, PUDs are more difficult to control because they're all unique. And you generally need the cooperation of the uh, property owners within the PUDs to uh, to get things changed. It's not like a, a standard zone district where we can do a legislative change uh, and 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 make it so. So um, I, I I I totally agree with what you said. I think uh, we we try to avoid PUDs whenever possible. Sometimes the situations just uh, you know don't align with with what's happening in Coors Tech is a, a good example of that. They just had kind of a complex uh, set of issues that they were dealing with that, that a standard code couldn't deal with. Uh, right. So that's why that route. F following up on that, I, I kind of see it as a bad sign for our shiny yeah, new. The recommendation <laughs> ends up being that, um, if the recommendation ends up being a, a an exemption for 100% affordable from that limitation that we could say permanent affordability um, so that we don't have the same preservation crisis 20 years down the road where we're losing things to market. <clears throat> uh, totally, 
I, I totally agree with the permanent affordability. So, so that, um, question to Rick, back to Rick, though. Um, I saw it as a bad sign on Colfax that one of the first developments is going in as a PUD. And that to me means that we need to look at the shiny new zoning code no. uh, to fix that. Well, uh, another thing I forgot to mention is I'd like to add ADUs to our list of things to, to look at. Okay. I was just going to briefly mention, Kathy, the reason they are doing a rezoning is because of the 25% commercial requirement we just talked about. That's a good segue. <laughs> so the, when, when uh, Lakewood did the, their exemption, did they do it legislatively or did they do an election? What did they do? The general election. Mm. To waive it. Oh, no, it's See, that's what I'm, that's, I, I think if we wanted to get rid of it, we'd have a general election. If we wanted to get an exemption, I think yeah. we could do it. Yes or no legislative. No, council can actually make that decision. Well, I think that's something that we need to make sure we understand. Because if yeah, we do we, have authority. You do. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, that goes off my plate. <laughs> do we want to see if anyone else um, online has, has thoughts and comments? Um, no, right. I think. Any anyone else yeah, online? Yeah. Sorry. Anyone sorry, else online sorry. want to sort of contribute right now? Oh, Just yeah. really Lori does. Go ahead and turn around. I think what I'll do is um, I can find out from um, Metro West how they're they're working on a new development now with the exemption. And just see if they're having any challenges or if you know it's truly just completely exempt and it's going well. So I'll find out and report back at next meeting. Lori, I have one question for you. Okay. Um, uh, regarding the parking, I know. So we're we're saying basically there's 40% of the parking not used. Is there any other examples that uh, can, you could help us with um, on sizes of understanding what that reduction in parking would look like? Um, um. We actually probably should do some parking studies at all of our properties and we have it. We just did the flats um, parking study. So um, I think what we know is one per unit is plenty. And most of our families, even if they are two or three person households, they, they don't have two cars. They just don't. So, um, you know, one per door is plenty and less if it's, um, if it's special, like permanent supported housing. Thank you. Anything else, Lori? I, I was just going to ask. I was just going to ask Lori if that number reflects um, eighty percent below AMI, sixty percent below in terms of what your projects are, and if we've got if if it is a limited AMI. I'm wondering if Janet, you can try and do some research to find out what kind of parking counts people are getting if they're doing a hundred percent AMI project or something uh, that's at a different level and some interaction with regards to the transit developments that are nearby or available transit resources that are available or not. Yeah, ours are all seven or six between 60 and 80 percent AMI and below. Very, very few 80% units. But, but that point you're making, or the point you're making is that we can end up with a step graph of some type yeah. mm -hmm. proximity to, tra to, to transport a number of units based on AMI for parking exemptions, where we, we do something that's thoughtful. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we're all being thoughtful, but I mean, that looks sensible based on what we're looking at it rather than a a blanket uh, exemption. I think that would be helpful for the public to understand the thinking that's going behind it. I just wanted to give a second the motion to Rick about the the Jeffco headquarters property. So right now in in our in our city, you know, we've got Habitat for Humanity, and we're being very helpful with them, and we're looking at other areas. Um, you know, and Jeffco, of course, has got their own affordable housing. In other locations in the county, but maybe they want to think about stepping up with regard to the property they own uh, that's there on the campus or other property they own 
but that one in particular, because it's in the city limits. So, uh, I'm not going to say that we're going to go do that now. It would be a recommendation. After our last meeting, if it still sticks, but I think that it's worthy of, of consideration. Uh, about looking at that property and seeing if they can. Uh, get on board with what we're trying to do in the city of Golden. Uh, Kathy's got her hand. Okay. Kathy, 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 um, yeah, for for parking, I, I do think that we need to uh, coordinate with mines because I think in, at least in the um, part of the city adjacent to the mines and I live, ac I live across the lid and we have mine students parking in our neighborhood. So I think a lot of our parking issues are, are mines related and you know, even building parking structures, you know, unless they're going to be affordable to the students, um, there's still going to be parking in town uh, rather than in the parking structures. So yay for more parking structures, but I, I've forgotten now what a student told me the the parking, uh, you know, street parking permits were, but they were really expensive. And, you know, students don't want to pay that kind of money, so they'll walk. So I, I think something that is unique, semi-unique to Golden that doesn't allow it to really uh, feed into the studies really well is that we've, we're, we've got mine students competing for the parking too. So I encourage more interactions between mines and the city to try to figure this out and lower price parking permits for students. Any comment, Mr. Slewinski? <laughs> Lots of comments. <laughs> <laughs> On the parking front, um, our our parking operates as an auxiliary fund, which is basically like an enterprise fund the city has. Um, and so any revenue gener generated from parking uh, permits um, from students, faculty, whomever, um, goes to support the operation. It doesn't go for any other reason. So uh, when we have to build new parking, um, it, it has the effect of increasing rates because we have to support the debt service for building the structure and it's 40 grand a space and that's on the low end. So, um, unfortunately that's, that's, that's the world. I mean, it's the parking world. Um, and, um, I know the city has undertaken a lot of regulations in surrounding neighborhoods, um, on 10th street here where students have traditionally parked. The effect that that has is forcing them back onto campus. Which means we have to build more parking, which means their rates go up. And so it's, it's a, it is a snowball effect to some to some degree. I view the solution as. Less parking and more transit. Because I think at the end of the day, we have a lot of people that commute into campus from areas where if they could be served. Adequately by transit, um. They wouldn't need to buy a parking permit. They wouldn't put that pressure on. On the campus or the community. Or they <laughs> so I guess I say all that to, to tell you that. So is Janet frozen for everybody else? Yeah, I'm not seeing her. I mean, I can just see a blank screen and I can't hear anything. Uh oh. Except you, I can hear you. <laughs> Lori, is it the same for you? Yeah, I can hear you guys and I can see you and you're moving fine, but everything else is frozen. I'm going to let uh, Lauren know. I think she's handling the technical end of things.
Thanks, Karen. I figure you have everybody's cell phone numbers. I do, yeah. <laughs> Look at all these ones that haven't been used. So we already have all of these, and if we exempt them, like it, we're still not going to hit that, game, right? Like so that to look at the the numbers gained from an ad, or if it's just roll over. If we could do legislative sneak peeks, we could do it and see how it goes. Lakewood said that we did it, and nothing's done, or we did it. And Got lots of applications. Well, you know, we can always adjust to circumstance, but to encourage it and get it started, I think that waiver for a pick percentage and picking percentage is a good idea. We should do that to see if we can generate what we're talking about. They didn't give me this as I'm just an advocate for, which I am, but the, around the table, people are just, you know, I'm saying, you don't have to be an advocate for affordable housing, but this is what our committee is doing. So I think we should be an advocate and go for that waiver and adjust it if we have to, but let's look downstream and let's not worry and do nothing. Worried about what might happen. Let's do something and then adjust to it. So that's how I feel about it. And I think the committee should, in its conclusions, ought to do that too. But that's just me. Guys online, can you hear us still? I'm so sorry. The computer died. We had to reboot you guys. Yeah, we can hear you now. Thanks. That parking reductions are very that we should fix. Did you all feel like there was any kind of like recommendation? I think there were like a bunch of ideas and what people do elsewhere. I think there has to be an Parking reduction is fixed, and we need to recommend that there's more investment in transportation because you can't yeah. just reduce parking and then have no other alternative. Yeah. You're going to create a problem. And right. that it should be part of a larger comprehensive plan to be strategic about where you're doing that. Investment and proximity, a couple of the comments we made. We need to, as Jason said earlier, we need a complete plan, not just a good idea. So we need to think it through. Beyond just saying, hey, let's lift the parking thing. Let's say why and, and what effect will it have? So I'm, I'm not trying to speak for you. Yeah, I'm just trying to say that we yeah. wrap it up into a bigger package. But I think in our recommendations, it's it's worth establishing there are two dynamics that affect parking that, that are observable, historical, whatever you want to call it, empirical, which are um, deed restricted affordable housing which is, you know, parking at a 60% ratio and closer to transit. So we've observed and we can document not just here that these two factors justify a reduced parking you know, from the current code. So I, I think at least establishing those as concepts is, is to help guide that policy is something that we can logically back up. But I would also to something I want to add something you said. I think simplifying uh, simplifying the one percent growth ordinance to the extent we can uh, be tremendous. No one's going to dig five steps down, like you said, and I think that's so true. When you start to not understand it, you give up. And so I would be. My view is to, I'd be overly aggressive on that front and really strip it down to um, the nuts and bolts of what you're you're trying to accomplish and and take out all the layers and you know things that um, just create confusion yeah and honestly i think that the reason they haven't had the starts or the use of that waiver in lakewood is because it's new and developers are scared to build in lakewood now because what does that mean what are we you know 
And so it's going to take time for folks to dig through all those barriers. So the thing we didn't talk about with parking was um, the commercial piece, because that impacts parking also. Um, so depending on, you know, the commercial use, you're going to have an additional parking requirement over and above the residential parking requirement. But the commercial parking is during the times the commercial is being used. And if it closes at six o'clock, then it's different than if it, you know, so then you have residential parking using the commercial parking. If we can think about how to make that work better. Right, but that doesn't come into play now, right? That's right. That's just, yeah. No, I mean, it can work, but it does depend on the uses that you have. So if, yep. if you have a restaurant that's open for dinner, that doesn't it's work. Well. Well. Yeah, it just creates the extra need for parking yep. outside, whereas an office use could be set. When one's building offices. So, so I think just a lot of the, like, the incentives we're talking about interplay so much that we have to be, we need to address those. So like, if we're going to do a density bonus, then what does that do to the parking requirement? Right? And if we're going to not address the 25% piece, like, what does that do when you have the density bonus? And, how, and all of those things just interplay so much. Um, but I think we have to think about all of them at the same time. So like that 25% commercial, in a project we are looking at right now has very like th there's a clear issue with it right because it because of the the parking requirements mm -hmm. honestly and so um if we were to change that and have all residential like what does that do and so really the only viable use for the commercial side in this particular project would be short-term rentals which i just don't love and so could we look at it differently to bring in a community benefiting commercial use and make it work, right? So like, like right now, the parking requirements and the way that it's structured, we couldn't have early childhood education, right? Because That's would it work? Hmm? That would it would, oh, but oh. the parking requirements would <laughs> Yeah, like so so it, it would also it, I don't know. So, like, all of those things, like, if there's, if there is a, if we reduce commercial, could there be, like, some sort of, like, just like affordable housing, um, if there's a community benefiting use to the commercial space, could that also impact uh, a reduction? Not in parking, but in percentage, sorry, which would then impact parking, obviously. I'd like to reiterate what Kathy Smith said earlier about density, bonus density in the Colfax or South Golden Road area, where bonus density downtown doesn't make much sense to me, but it makes a heck of a lot of sense. Uh, areas that are, uh, you know, still developable. So no one's going to tear down a building on Washington and build a bunch of the new buildings, the new construction is going to be probably outside the downtown area. So where we have mixed use development and multi stories up to four stories, I'd like to think we should give density bonuses that will make sense for uh, a developer or a builder who's trying to put in some affordable housing. Does that get to your overlay piece earlier? In other words, areas that do overlay, whether it's parking or density or places like that. Uh, Kathy Sorry, Kathy. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is great. A ditto to that about the um, uses. I, I guess my, my question is, can, can we do this through the zoning code and get rid of the density table and and let the zoning code drive the dense of uh, the, the allowed density? Is there is there a planning yeah. way to do that? Funny, funny you should mention that. Uh, that is actually what we're doing right now with this phase two code update. So the density table that is in chapter 1828, 18.28 is going away uh, if council adopts it. Um, but uh, yeah, so it'll all be controlled by the form. We, we, we've gone to a form based zoning code. So density is controlled by the forms that you choose for your development. And there's a set number of forms that you, you have options for in different areas of town. So. That is going so, away. So, so the secret is to 
in the areas so we're, that you really want to, to do some planning in. Discussion. Um, I, I want to make sure we've captured everything, but one of the things I think from a staff standpoint we can do now is to look at each of those things that Rick talked about. Let's look at the recommendations that we, we are hearing from you all on those and maybe send those back out to kind of make sure we've captured everything um, and then bring that back to the, to the next meeting as well and say, okay, just real quick, or if you guys can give us feedback online as well, real quick, um, what do we, are we right? sort of on some of these recommendations um, that you all would like to consider going forward. Does that make sense um, from that standpoint? Okay. If so, we will we will take a crack at that. Is there anybody who didn't get a chance to some, share something that, that they really feel is important to sort of add to this discussion around um, these items? Okay. So the next thing I think that's important is to understand things that you all might want to look at at the next meeting. So if there are programs or policies or um, things that you have seen work in other communities in other cities, that you all would like us to explore um, in meeting number three and bring you back more information on or research more information to share back with you. Um, that's kind of what we'd like to hear sort of in these last 15 or 20 minutes or so. One, one thing that I think is kind of missing from our schedule. When we're talking about density, um, all building heights and forms don't cost the same. So at three, four stories, if you're building with wood on grade or, you know, something subgrade, once you start going, you know, five, six, seven stories, your building types changing um, and getting far more costly. So I think for this committee to understand you know, the cost of a garden, a garden unit um, that's affordable, a cost of a podium unit, a cost of a type one, you know, post tension concrete tower unit um, is useful context for the whole group to say, okay, even if we are incentivizing a density bonus, not all units cost the same. And, you know, I think that's just useful information uh, that we can all consider. Kathy, you're on. Thanks. Um, one thing that I think is missing from from this is uh, that we're not interacting. Rick mentioned planning commission is doing this uh, some things, and I think Europe probably is too. Um, how how can this committee be able to act, interact with planning commission and Gura? Can we? Add one more partial meeting at the end to to interact with with um, the other the other city groups. Um, and I would also like to look at um, the influence of reducing fees um, for various things and and simplifying approval processes uh, for various things and also some sort of a way to um, incentivize people not to scrape small things to build bigger single family things. So some sort of a demolition fee. So one area where we talk about other cities, we have specific areas that we've talked about today. So as we look at other cities, rather than just saying, what do you got? I think we might be specific and and they can or can't, but if they had the data on bullet A, B, C, and D, which are the ones we're interested in, I think it would be helpful. For example, the parking for affordable height. You know, that, that's a specific question versus just asking what the heck they're doing. Because I don't know that we'll get the feedback we're looking for if we make a general question, they're not spe specific. I, I just want to follow up on what you said. Um, I think what's super important and not just useful information is exactly what you're talking about, all the different types of construction and costs of construction, because I think we're looking at it a little bit a little bit backwards in that we're trying to create, you know, regulations or policies that would um, prohibit developers from building market, right? 
And what we should be looking at is how to encourage the building of affordable affordable units based on what's doable and what's not doable for uh, developers. You, Lakewood's a good example. They exempt all the affordable units from their 1% and yet it hadn't done anything yet. Because maybe it's not hitting the sweet spot of what the developer is looking at. Yeah, and Lori, I'll, I'll get that information to you. The one thing that, that sticks in my mind is the tax credit cycle. Um, and usually it's August before, you know, when you get your applications in for tax credits. And if that went into effect in July, it probably has not had a chance to hit that tax credit cycle yet. Um, and so my, that's just the thought I yeah. think of when people haven't used it. The types of folks that will probably use it are people are going to do 100%. They'll do tax credit deals. Right, and also um, Metro West, I'll I think, is currently doing something different. Thank you. The other, the other comment tagging on to what Jason just said is, you know, there has to be a subsidy element in many of these projects that likely would have to come in some way from the city. That may be land. It may be uh, per bedroom cost, whatever it is. City right now, this is a barrier that we didn't talk about. City has a, a limitation in terms of what we can provide to a developer to build in terms of a financial incentive. And so that's another piece that we probably need to talk about as a group and whether or not we want to, that's a charter amendment uh, that would need to happen. And so that does need a vote. Uh, but that's something that I probably should be on the list of things that are being considered by this group because right now, uh, for example, the Habitat project, we're, we've put in for a $3 million grant the way that we're getting around that limitation is that it's really just a pass through. We're, we're the applicant and we're serving simply as a pass through of that dollar amount. But if we had in the bank at the city, $2 million that we wanted to give to a project, to a developer that wants to build something affordably, we don't have the ability to do that right now. And so we need to make some changes to charter associated with that. The charter limits um, the amount of incentive that the city can provide to any developer. Uh, this goes back, as I understand it, back to the uh, development of the Home Depot and some other projects in the city that riled up the community about we're giving money uh, to these sorts of developments that are not necessarily embraced by the community. And so it's it's a very broad language and it's very restrictive as a result. So again, you would you could go in, you could make a change. Uh, that change would wouldn't would be much more narrow in terms of what would be allowed as a charter amendment. Not giving the whole thing doesn't matter. Nope, simply does not matter. So, so just wanted to mention that as another barrier. Yeah, so that's another big one. Again, we don't necessarily have huge funding sources right now at the city, but if there were, if if money becomes available in some fashion or another, it becomes a big restriction. So it's something that we should be mindful of. Cannot rent for below market value. We cannot transfer or sell sell any city land for below market value, which of course would be need to be able to support some developers um, by doing that. So yeah, I think the number. So fee waivers or reductions, I believe, if it's considered a program, in other words, it's funded for everybody, um, or in a category, that it's okay. But that's that is something else to explore. But I, I think that the fee waiver piece, um, getting at the idea of creating maybe a grant fund that would pay for the fee waivers for specific kind of uh, program or projects that serve particular folks. So, and a trust fund can do that as well. We have a trust fund. So, phrase we used, which was workforce housing, is a, you know, in terms of the public listening to us, is preferable to affordable housing. It just happens to be one. Because we are people that work for the city can't afford to live here. And when we say workforce housing, we're thinking about city employees, our police, our fire department, but we're also thinking about others that work in the city. That, and, and that is the workforce we're talking about. We're not trying to say we're making affordable housing for anybody that comes to gold. And we're talking about people that are, are here now. And that's the ones we're focused on now. You know, talking to Lori, you can't, it's hard to reserve and she can certainly fill us on on reserving spots. But if you bring the land, that's a help. But for city employees, the applications, when I thought about flats at Ford, applications are now open. It didn't say you had to be this or you had to be that. But I think for city employees, 
if we had the application form filled out with everything in it, but their signature, and not, not quite like that, but we made it easy for our own employees to apply. And when the thing opened, we could apply and be at the, if there is a front of the line that we'd be close to the front of the line because we prepared our own city employees for applying for workforce housing. And some of the other things that I think we've heard in prior meetings, um, the, the ADU grant potential, the restriction potential that some of the other cities are using um, to get at that. So we'll include those uh, ideas as well and bring you guys some information around that as well too. So, and then if you think of other things between now and a couple of weeks from now, just so that we can get some time to do some research on them and, and we'll put them into the folder for you all to read. Um, just other programs that just, we, you know, we, I know you can't go through 20 of them in two hours, but you might be able to sort of narrow down to about 10 programs that you think you might want to look at uh, that might work in the city of Golden that does that's worked in other cities or, or where you've seen, I think you brought up the sort of individual development accounts and, and the tenant equity piece. Um, that's a, another piece uh, to look at as well. So, um, Anybody else on online that wants to share sort of thoughts or ideas about programs we need to look at next time? No. Okay. Fort Collins has a great land banking program. Okay. Um, there will be funds available for land banking. I, I know there's not a lot of land in Golden, but let's say that something were to happen with the, the Jeffco campus that became available. If the city could, for, you know, and I'm not sure what's a, what's allowed in, in the in the charter, but um, if you can create that, um, they their program is is really awesome because it they are able to be very controlled about what they want where, like they've got a piece of land they like they they want for home ownership, this they want for, um, you know, this certain um, workforce housing element and um, because nonprofits and developers won't need to buy it and hold it, right? The city can come in and doesn't have those same carrying costs, um, and so can pass that on at a at a better rate. Than, yeah. I mean, obviously you'd have to change your charter yeah. to get there, but um, if you could do that and could pair it with a um, with a land banking program, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah. They set themselves up really well for the future. Yeah, thinking exactly because you buy, you know, and you're at today's prices, even though you're developing them. So, so. I think Kathy has ready. Kathy, you ready? Yeah, I'm. I'm ready. Um, one thing we didn't talk about was the uh, sustainability um, net zero, um, and and I do think we. <laughs> Definitely need to look at exclusions for subsidized uh, housing. Um, the uh, the um, income restricted housing because the the costs are so tight. And I would I would like to encourage Lori and and others who who build that kind of housing to to weigh in about the financing and and whether or not it's important and this drives them away and could we look at something like um, asking that this housing be net zero ready and and put it on the city to find funding sources to 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 do the rest the installation of the actual uh, solar panels and and uh, equipment so i would like to put that out there too Slides had that suggestion on the bottom that there'd be a fund mm -hmm. to cover that differential cost, which that's the best. That would be the best scenario, I would say, because I wouldn't want to not. Yeah, I wouldn't want to exempt these this this from you know what's a really great goal is to have everything electrified. But Kathy's right; it's so it's so slim that it's just really difficult to do. Um, so if there were a funding source for that differential, that would. That'd be great. Okay, um, and then the final question, sort of, uh, how are the meetings working besides technology challenges? Uh, we want to make sure that we're hearing from you and that you feel like you have the ability to really share 
um, your, your thoughts and input and that we are capturing that and feeding that back to you that we're not over duly influencing anything. So we do want to make sure that the, the structures of these meetings are such that you all feel you have a chance to do that. And if not, are there things we need to change at the meetings going forward? Uh, how we're giving you information in advance, uh, things like that that would make these meetings more productive because we only have you guys for a couple hours a month. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> As a developer, it feels good to be heard and be able to speak kind of more openly and freely without, you know, always got this other agenda. Here's the problem we're trying to solve um, and how to create an ecosystem to make projects more viable. So, yeah, and uh, Janet, I think you've done an amazing job of collecting information and providing it and facilitating. Well, thank you. It's a really great team. We've got some some good folks involved. It's taking two or three of us to do all this, um, but they're doing they're doing wonderful work. So Karen uh, actively taking notes up there and gives us a chance to pull everything together when we've got recordings and we've got double people taking notes, um, then we, we're really trying to make sure we capture everything that you say. So. I also just want to confirm access the, the Not yet, but I, <laughs> I know who to call. Okay. <laughs> So for the next meeting, like I said, we will try to get these notes back out to you, pull together what we are hearing and categorize things um, and to start sharing recommendations. And if you can feed back to us before the next meeting, if we are missing something that you think was said or that you want what would like to see the committee consider, um, that we'll have something really focused to work on next meeting alongside of these other programs that we are um, thinking maybe uh, there might be some recommendations that come out with regards to other programs as well. So um, if that works uh, for everybody, we can we can go along with that strategy. So I think that's everything we have for you guys today. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we will see us next March 23rd, um, same time, same place with better technology. Thank you.